Closed captioning provided by Beaufort County. I heard you <laughs> loud and clear. Good evening, everyone. We are together tonight, Tuesday, August 10th, for a Bluffton Town Council meeting. Um, we are all in attendance with the exception of uh, Mr. Toomer. Um, so we will start by Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the invocation with Mr. Wood. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Wood. Join me in prayer, please. For the people of our community and for every city and community, let us give thanks to the Lord for the good earth which God has given us and for the wisdom to conserve it. Let us give thanks to the Lord for the poor and the oppressed, aged and infirm, for the sick and those suffering and for those who need a kind word and to know they are valuable and loved. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us remember to treat each other with kindness, love and respect and to give thanks to the Lord. Father, may we humble ourselves before you and give thanks for all the glorious things you do. And we offer up a special prayer for the Tumor family this evening and their little granddaughter, Lonnie. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Um, next, we have meeting minutes of July 13th. Um, they were in your packet. If there are no changes, is there a motion to accept? I um, move. Um, Fred and then is there a second? We second. Second. Is that second. All in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much. We have presentations, celebrations, and recognitions. Prior to that, let me if I could relay some information on Mr. Toomer and Mr. Rock and um, daughter and granddaughter. I was there all day with them. Um, she is out of surgery. I don't think the PD got on the loop of the update, and I apologize. Um, but she went in about 9:30. They came out and talked to the family at. 4.15, oh, an hour and a half longer. It was the first surgery of this kind ever to be performed at Memorial. They had a lot of people around them, a very awesome doctor and a lot of the brand new equipment and all the people with, that were in charge of the equipment. So it was a lot of people around that little baby. She had three pockets of fluid about the size of a golf ball and y'all her little head she's just a year so her little head's not much bigger size grapefruit really um, but she's out of surgery she's still under anesthesia coming out of it but doctor said thumbs up it was a success so please they both the rock and tumor family thank you all for your prayers um, they were heard they were at it they were at loose ends but they knew their faith was strong and and I know we all supported them that way um, so anyway, thank you for the prayer. So I hope better news even an hour from now. So first, introduction of new employees. Who is up first? Hello, Mrs. Colin. How are you? Thank you. Okay, I think they're coming in. <laughs> Who is up? Who's coming in first? Okay. Um, First, I'd like to introduce Katie Ponce. She is a customer service representative. Um, she has a bachelor's in human services from USCB and came to us from uh, Horizon Rehab and Sports Medicine. So. Wonderful, welcome. welcome, Katie. Next, we have Jordan Holloway. He is a senior planner here. He is um, has his bachelor's in geo-environmental studies from Shippensburg University and has come to us from Savannah Metropolitan Planning Commission. So he does things from tree permits, sign permits, and development review. So. Thank you. Welcome. Oh, thank you. While you're bringing that up, just these aren't people we just hired yesterday. No. We've had a year, <laughs> years, we're at totally completely changing, but it's been almost over a year's worth of employees that we always like to introduce to the public. So just before I get Facebook. Yes. <laughs> and Sharon White, she actually started, I think, just before um, COVID. So maybe about 18, the week before Happy COVID. <laughs> Sharon White is a receptionist here. She's from George Washington University and was an IT manager at Wayne Brothers. So she is uh, the initial face you see when you enter customer service in town hall. 
Now we have uh, Glenn Umberger. He is our new historic preservationist. He comes to us from uh, special projects at the New York Landmarks Conserv Conservancy, and he was a graduate from SCAD. So he's our new historic preservationist that you'll probably be seeing here in the next couple months with Wonderful. lots of new policies. Welcome. Thank you. All right, and then the most difficult name to pronounce, hope I get this right, Lizeth Trujillo. She actually um, started as a customer service representative and has been recently promoted today, as a matter of fact, as the customer service uh, supervisor. Thank so, Congrats. Um, welcome to Liz. Welcome. So, we have um, <laughs> some big shoes to fill with Liz moving on to the supervisor position. So, that uh, position, the customer service rep, is advertised, I think, now on our Facebook page and our town's website. So if anyone knows anyone who's a good fit for up front, we'd love to have them. That's it for this month for me. Anyone else? Steve? Hello, Mayor and Council. How y'all doing? It is my absolute pleasure, pleasure to be up here before you today because we are going to witness one of our very own getting promoted to corporal tonight. Zach, will you please come up with your fiance, Miss Hill? Council, this is that pouch prom. He is currently a detective in our criminal investigations division, and this is his fiance, Miss Hill, Miss Jamie Hill, and she will be holding the Bible for him as he takes his oath of office and the oath of honor. She will also be pinning his badge on after. So please join me. That raise your right hand and repeat after me. I that pouch prom. I, Zat Pouchprom, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. I will support, protect, and defend. That I will support, protect, and defend. The Constitution. The Constitution. And the government of the United States. And the government of the United States. And the state of South Carolina. And the state of South Carolina. I will render strict obedience. I will render strict obedience. To my supervisors. To my supervisors. And observe and abide. And observe and abide. By all orders and regulations prescribed. By all orders and regulations prescribed. By them. I will maintain strict. I will maintain strict. Punctual and constant. Punctual and constant. Attention to my duties. Attention to my duties. I will abstain from. I will abstain from. All offensive personality. All offensive personality. Or conduct unbecoming an officer. Or conduct unbecoming an officer. I will perform my duties. I will perform my duties. As an officer with the Bluffton Police Department. As an officer with the Bluffton Police Department. Fearlessly. Fearlessly. Impartially. Impartially. And with all due courtesy. And with all due courtesy. I will well and faithfully perform. I will well and faithfully perform. The duties of a law enforcement officer. The duties of a law enforcement officer. So help me God. So help me God. And now the oath of honor. On my honor. On my honor. I will never betray my badge. I will never betray my badge. My integrity. My integrity. My character. My character. Or the public trust. Or the public trust. I will always have the courage. I will always have the courage. To hold myself and others. To hold myself and others. Accountable for our actions. Accountable for our actions. And I will always uphold the Constitution. And I will always uphold the Constitution. My community. My community. And the agency in which I serve. And the agency. Now the pinning. I'll take the Bible. Break of Corporal. I present to you, Mayor and Council, your newly promoted And you need to thank your fiance for putting up with all of this. <laughs> yeah, she's the most important one. Thank you, Mayor and Council. <laughs> thank you, sir. Congratulations. Is that all on um, introduction of new employees? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
Moving on to recognition. Oh, we did that. I'm so sorry. Um, Sand Shark Week proclamation. As y'all have noticed, we have the banners up uh, on May River Road, and uh, they were provided from USCB, and it just welcomes all the new students to their town. So they have a Sand Shark Week, and you might see them around Saturday, Kim. They're doing with new students a treasure hunt, so they might be all through town. So if you're out and about, um, you'll see them. Is there anyone from USCB that is accepting the proclamation? Okay, I will read it. Whereas the University of South Carolina Beaufort is a fully accredited comprehensive baccalaureate institution within the University of South Carolina system. Whereas USCB provides specialized instruction in 19 undergraduate degree programs and two graduate degrees to fulfill its mission to respond to regional needs, draw upon regional strengths, and prepare graduates to contribute locally, nationally, and internationally. Whereas USCB is a primary regional resource for exceptionally skilled healthcare professionals, teachers, hospitality managers, science-based researchers, and computational trouble troubleshooters in the South Carolina Low Country. And I might add awesome interns that turn into employees in the town of Bluffton. Um, USCB has a reputation for institutional prominence as a regional problem solver, catalyst for progress, and engine for economic growth. Whereas this week, USCB welcomes more than 2,100 students, their parents, and other family members and friends to campuses in Bluffton, Beaufort, and Hilton Head Island, and to athletic facilities in the Hardyville for the start of the 2021 academic year. Therefore, the town of Bluffton here pro proclaims the week of uh, 19 of August to the 21st to excuse me August 19th to the 25th 2021 as USCB Sand Shark Welcome Week. So we will get that to them. I think I'm reading this at the convocation. So should I just keep this? Mm -hmm. I will keep this. Um, welcome if you're watching, and we look forward to seeing y'all around town in our restaurants and coffee shops and parks, and um, we just offer you a great welcome. Next, we have a Blueprint Bluffton update. Andrew, there you are. Good evening. Greetings. How are you? Council, yes, good. We've uh, had a good uh, time here in Bluffton the last couple of days, and I just wanted to share an update of where we are with Blueprint Bluffton, the comprehensive plan uh, that we're working on here. So I can advance the slides here on this. Excellent, perfect. Uh, for those that don't um, know us, uh, I'm Andrew Overback, principal and planner with MKSK. Uh, we are landscape architects, urban designers, and urban planners with offices throughout the Southeast and the Midwest. Uh, we're excited to be here in Bluffton, uh, working with a great team of professionals uh, locally, uh, Thomas and Hutton, who will be helping us, uh, who is helping us with utilities and stormwater infrastructure, Kimley Horn, providing economic development and natural resources and resiliency expertise, and then in Savannah, Sotil and Sotil, Christian Sotil, I think you know well as, as well, uh, doing uh, historic um, architecture and historic preservation for us. Uh, so we've got a great team of, of local uh, consultants. Uh, we've, we've all sort of worked in and around uh, Bluffton and the community over the last several years, so we're very familiar with Bluffton and excited to get to know folks here. Um, uh, focus of our work, uh, really the purpose of this, this planning effort not just to take a sort of fresh look at the comprehensive plan, um, but to support the vision that you all have laid out and the principles that you all have laid out in your strategic plan. Um, we've already heard from the community about how we need to balance uh, growth with the unique natural and historic features that are here in Bluffton, uh, make sure that we guide that appropriately, so that's a, a key topic. Um, we're engaging with the community throughout. I'll show you some facts and figures about how many folks we've engaged at this point in the early part of the process. We're looking to build trust with the community through doing this work. And then a final plan <clears throat> that's easy to communicate and understand both for your staff to use, um, but also for the community to use as well. So that's, uh, those are our goals. Um, the state of South Carolina has 10 required plan elements that we will be uh, working through. Uh, we spent some time with our steering committee this morning going through a preliminary uh, draft of our needs assessment. So we're reviewing that with, with town staff as well. And it covers all of these required plan elements. Uh, and then again, we're looking at the strategic focus areas that you all have laid out uh, in, in your work to make sure that we're uh, following through on, on that promise um, from the town. And we're also looking through uh, both previous planning efforts and ones that are ongoing today. So uh, this is a list of all the other work that we're looking at that's been done prior to this plan to make sure we take all that into account and to capture everything 
uh, that the greater community and region are working on through transportation planning, uh, updates that you all are doing to your stormwater, stormwater code, uh, all of those things we're trying to bake into this process and make sure that this update has everything in it that needs to be in it. Um, this is our study area. So generally, uh, it's a little hard to see on this screen because it's a little washed out, um, but the gray areas are the town, uh, but we have sort of a larger area inside this orange line that captures unincorporated parts uh, of the county. Uh, so we're incorporating both those areas and the town boundary. And as a process overview, just to give you an update on where we are, uh, we spent the first few months doing uh, research and review um, we conducted our initial community engagement. We're currently in the needs assessment phase. Uh, so that's the work that we're currently doing with town staff and our steering committee. And we'll bring back uh, a further update as we get deeper into the process. Um, but I did want to provide at least a snapshot to you all of, of what we've done from an engagement standpoint to this date. We will obviously have lots of other opportunities to engage the community through this work. Um, but we've engaged nearly 700 people uh, so far in the early part of this process both in online surveys where we have more than 520 responses. Uh, we did a couple community roundtable uh, virtual events uh, that, that got 52 attendees, uh, and we had 90 individuals we reached out to and did uh, stakeholder roundtables with, so deeper conversations uh, with, with a, a large group of people to give us an understanding of the community and a broad cross-section of the community. And then we're working with the steering committee to help us as, as they advise us through this process. So, um, that was our second meeting here this morning that we conducted with them. Um, we will be putting that uh, initial engagement summary up on the uh, project website so that the entire community can see that, and we're going to ask people if they feel like the input we've gotten so far is reflective of their, their sort of feelings and understandings of what needs to happen as part of this plan uh, as we progress. So we'll be soliciting further input uh, on, on that summary here in the next couple weeks. And then we're moving on through our needs assessment in divisioning and policy direction and looking to reach back out to the community before the end of the year with uh, a draft of those things for everyone to review. So that's an update on where we are in the process and happy to answer any questions if you have some. Any questions? The website. So it is on uh, the town's website and there's a page. So I'm sure Heather or... Uh, Prominent. Yeah. 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 There's also a spotlight. I think all of us need to get this out to everyone. I actually brought it up to Stephen this morning quickly on the phone. I know you were asked to get paper surveys out mm -hmm. to churches, and mm -hmm. I do think that's a good idea. Um, when we did our charrettes decades ago, we had yeah. about the same number of people. Right. So we've grown exponentially. That's so right. that's not exciting that we've had such a small number of... This is just the beginning, I think, over when we get to the end of the process, we'll engage a lot more people, but we did talk this morning about getting paper surveys out. Uh, we have those ready to go, so we can get those out to different groups, and then again, we're going to be conducting different types of outreach um, uh, through sharing what we've learned so far and making sure that we're on the right track. So we'll ask for that for, from people as well. Um, I know that there's a way to put those in uh, without spending a lot on postage, even in, inside of the newspaper, or perhaps some of these magazines could stick them in for us? Is there some way to get them in people's mailboxes it, without spending a lot of money on postage, I think would be? Yeah, that's a good idea to investigate that, yeah. Any questions? Good start, thank you for yeah. taking this on. It's really, really important. It is our blueprint, truly a blueprint for our town and um, we have 20,000 plus people and this is the time to speak up, not just at election time, but this is the time to really give your input um, and speak up. So if you're listening, <laughs> um, please, please go to our website. It is an image that you'll be able to click on very easily. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll continue to keep working and, and help you get the word out. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Public comment. We have public comment. You are uh, required to submit it electronically, but we are right now allowing you to come in to speak your public comment and then leave. Um, so who arranges when we call their name? Catherine is going to let Catherine. So the first is Jean, and I'm going to botch it bad. Ciccarelli? Ciccarelli. Is that right? Yep. There you go. Jean, if you could say your name <laughs> and your address so we can have it for our minutes, and then you have three minutes. 
Absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so it's Gene Ciccarelli. I live at 535 Heathwood Drive in Bluffton slash Oakety, South Carolina. Not really sure where I live these days, but that's where Going it is. Um, yeah, so I'll be brief. Um, I have no choice. Three minutes just shortchanges the public. I found this out in June when I raced like a fool to make a statement at the Hardyville Council meeting uh, on the same subject of development. As Mayor Selker, you uh, once wrote in the Bluffton Sun, over 90% of Bluffton is owned by developers. Uh, this was shocking to me. I said to myself, we're doomed. What recourse is there to control what appears to be a future Florida city right here in the making? Florida cities that are overcrowded and bursting at the seams. Almost every square inch of them are paved over. Thank goodness for the ocean and the Gulf. So if this is what we have to look forward to, it might be better to rename Bluffton after a street sign that I no once noticed by Vaden Automotive. The sign said, Lost Oaks Drive. And I said, that's so fitting. Traffic alone is a major concern. I am very sick of seeing accidents and ambulances routinely on 170 and 278. I feel sorry for out-of-towners who do not know how dangerous these two roads are some with families traveling with children. And yet development roars on with a hurricane strength. We are very fortunate, blessed, to have had sufficient rainfall to sustain us here. But you never know when this might change. Major areas of the West are under a severe drought. A city in Utah had to stop further development because their water levels were too low. The mayor of that city stated, "We are." Why are we building houses if we don't have enough water? If oversaturation cannot be prevented, and if we truly are doomed, then there should be a regional tie-in for non-automotive alternatives like bicycles, walking, golf carts, etc. Who really wants to sit in traffic and deal with accidents? A simple formula should be infrastructure first, development last. Some municipalities get this backwards. So before a shovel is in the ground, developers should pay for all negative impacts. They should put funds into escrow for any unforeseen problems. Wholesale clear cutting and more coliform waste in the May River is not the answer. Croaking frogs are what future generations should hear, not croaking people. You, the members of this council, are the last lines of defense. Go to bat for us while you still can. Thank you for my three minutes. I keep, can I have a copy of your, uh, your, <coughs> your statement? Oh, yeah, you can have this. Wait, wait, wait. Can, can you I hand just it to the... Leave I've it. got it. Are you got it on the yeah. comment? Thank you very much. Thank you, Appreciate sir. Um, as he's leaving, Jake Higgins. Good. It is good morning, unless you've had lunch. Well, my days uh, run together. Um, Jake, name and address, please, sir, and you have three minutes. Jake Higgins, 152 Hampton Lake Drive in Bluffton, South Carolina. So I'm Jake Higgins. I own uh, several businesses here in the town and several outside of the town and in all 50 states. Car wash here on Bluffton Parkway that uh, about a month ago, the town did an inspection um, and said that the car wash drains into the storm drain, which was approved by the then town council 15 years ago to be done that way. Um, so that incurred the request to get a sewer line put in uh, to Buford Jasper sewer. Uh, with that installation comes the permission or the impact fee cost, uh, which is several thousands of dollars. The first estimate we had was over $300,000. That was just for the sewer. That would be required by the town to, to stop draining into the storm drain. Uh, Buford Jasper Water also requires if you use their sewer, you must use their water line. That incurs another impact fee, the first estimate, well over $130,000. So the first initial out of cost would have been close to a half a million dollars possibly just for the permission to do the construction, which is almost $100,000, ripping up a parking lot that I just replaced. And I have 12 full-time employees, all of which who live in Bluffton. Um, and my car wash is the most inexpensive car wash. It services the low to middle income folks in the town. Um, which are able to afford that and has self-serve bays. So my request is simple. Uh, after the estimate came out from Buford Jasper Water, finally, the correct estimate 
it's a $92,000 right now. And that might be an open cost for those impact fees because uh, that's an estimate. And so they say once they can meter that water being used, uh, then they would be able to come and hit me again with more impact fees because if we don't guess right, this car wash has never had a meter. It uses well water, which I just replaced at $15,000 the month prior to this. Uh, I eat that. I'm out that too. So my request is just to simply use the town credits that's gifted to them from Buford Jasper Water if possible uh, for those impact fees. If not, we will shut down, and that's 12 employees, and then the town loses another. Oh, all of my staff all over the United States, I have over 6,000 employees, and they're all aware of uh, Larry's um, family, and everybody's praying for them, and uh, Jacqueline and Tyler. I told them if they were bored, they could watch this, but I don't think they're bored enough, but I know they heard you. And, and thank you, too, for all your help with this. Um, Thank you. We don't respond to public comment, but um, we are. You are walking out, so as you're walking out, I would ask if Stephen could you and Brian get with him or see what, just kind of figure out what's going on and give us an idea. Mm -hmm. Thing from Mayor and Council. Yes, I would just like to extend um, for the educators and administrators watching. Uh, good welcome back and. Um, hopes for a successful year as they started preschool um, this week and our kids go back to school on uh, Monday of next week. There's also an opportunity, I believe, on Thursday um, for anyone interested or still wanting to receive a free vaccine um, for COVID that's being held at Bluffton Middle this Thursday, August the 12th. And I believe you can go online to Beaufort Memorial and uh, sign up for that. And it is free. Um, I, could we get that on our town site and our police department, social media? Um, I do think it's important for people to give prayerful or dutiful thought to why you are not getting the vaccine. Um, I've heard several, um, today I've had the radio in my ear, but, you know, just look at the science of it. Don't get caught up in the politics of it and make your own decisions, but just make them based on fact, not fiction and fear. Um, I'm proud to say my bubble has had the vaccine and I think I'm a bubble within a bubble. All of us up here have had our vaccine. I hope you're okay that I said that. Um, and um, I jokingly said I've only gotten meaner. So I think that's the side effect I've gotten. <clears throat> but other than that, I still have, don't have extra arms or fingers. So um, I think we're living proof. We we took on the challenge of getting it, and just really urge you all to consider it. Um, anything else on this side? Yeah. Thank you, um, Stephen. And I talked a couple councils ago, and I think we're going to start implementing it because we're all on different committees from the council, and it might be a good time during this time to give any updates. Locog, uh, Waypack affordable housing because we never really get to talk about our they're not vote you know they're advisory committees but y'all I won't put you on the spot now but if you have any updates from anything you're on even Martin Luther King um, committee we'd love to hear them at this time so not to put you on the spot unless you're willing to jump in we'll we'll start this next month um, to give you an opportunity to say you've met or not met and any highlights of, of what you spend your <clears throat> other rest of your personal time uh, being part of. But we'll add that on this. Um, public hearing and final hearing, consider uh, final reading, consideration of an ordinance amending the Town of Bluffton Code of Ordinances, Chapter 23, Article 4, Section 319, and Section 321, Article 5, Section 513, and 515, 6, Article 9. Do you see how I cut out all those words? <laughs> um, this is a public hearing, so I will call for comment. Do we have any public comment for public hearing? Well, I'll go through it. First call for public comment on the public hearing. Um, I mentioned in item number nine. Second call for public comment for the public hearing on the item in on the agenda uh, number nine. Third and final call for public comment for the public hearing of the agenda item under agenda item nine. 
public hearing is closed. Heather, any changes, anything you want to add from last month's um, first reading? No, there have been no changes since first reading. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, go through the presentation again, or just pull up the motion. I defer to you all. Questions, no changes from what we talked about? No. Just pull up the motion. Yeah, you have to stay. I have another one. I have In one. another seat. <laughs> if there's a, no questions of Heather's or a motion to approve second and final reading of the amendments to the Town of Bluffton Code of Ordinances, Chapter 23, Unified Development Ordinance. It's Article 3, Section 319, and Section 321, which are site feature uh, historic district and sign permits. Article 5, uh, which are the design standards, Section 515, 515. Uh, and Article 9, which are definitions. So moved. You guys, there's second. second. Any discussion? All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. I'd read it a lot faster if I could. Um, next, we're on to formal items. Heather, this one is our first reading. It's amending the Town of Bluffton Code of Ordinances, Chapter 23, uh, Article 3, application process to establish Section 3.26, proactive preservation and maintenance of contrib contributing structures. Yes, thank you. So um, while he's pulling up that presentation here, this is coming before you tonight. Um, can I pull up the PowerPoint? I'm here tonight on this particular item that we refer to as proactive preservation. Some refer to that as demolition by neglect because that was something that town council had identified um, in the strategic plan action agenda items um, to move forward with. We had, had come before you uh, back in July, I think of last year, for a workshop uh, on this item. And at that time, the request was to add in some provisions for economic hardship. So we took all of those comments uh, into account and went ahead and did incorporate that um, in the presentation moving forward. So again, just uh, while we're getting that up here, so what is proactive preservation? Really what it's meant to do is to go ahead and prevent structures from just deteriorating, um, you know, without that regular maintenance. So that's, I'm sorry. Yep. <laughs> So, and again, you know, and the reasons of neglect may not be, you know, on purpose or something that is very purposeful, but so what we're trying to do is just increase that awareness, um, you know, it could be financial inability, and again, there's some provisions in there for uh, economic hardship, and what I will um, preface all of this presentation with is that the next several months, you met Glenn Umberger, our historic preservationist, and there are several items in your strategic uh, plan that were identified with historic preservation. Some of them economic incentives, Bailey Bill, for example. There's also some other provisions that we have um, discussed as a staff that include, for example, provisions to even not just protecting the structures, but the property. So that could be trees, tree removal, it could be trimming, pruning, something that may pose a threat to the contributing uh, historic resources. So that is one of the agenda items that will be, be coming uh, before you in the next couple months, along with the Bailey Bill, which was identified, along with contributing structures and some changes that we need to do to align our unified development ordinance in order to enact those. So this is kind of that first piece of the puzzle that we're proposing because we have workshopped it. Uh, we are proposing that this, should it move forward, that it become uh, effective January 1, so that you could use all of these different pieces and parts and these tools in the toolbox um, to preserve your structure, if your contributing structure, if you'd like to, and provide some incentives and some relief in doing so. So like I said, and this is that first piece, uh, something that we plan to bring forward. With the proactive preservation, 
it will um, come with also a preservation plan. So staff would work with the property owner on what are the steps to do to stabilize it. Uh, you may have seen recently the red dot building on May River Road, something that we have worked uh, for years to get stabilized. So that roof has been uh, stabilized with some uh, timbers and some wood to just make sure that that roof stays up and in place. So that's that temporary measure to make sure that there's no further deterioration. So again, when I say uh, contributing structure right now, um, what we're uh, proposing is that this only apply to what's already been identified and approved as contributing structures. So as that list approved by council changes and evolves, um, this would change along with that. Right now, currently, we have 82 contributing structures. Two are listed individually on, that, on the National Register. So those particular structures um, would apply to this ordinance. This here shows the map of both our local district as well as our national district. Just again, to give you some reference, we do this map, um, it's more to for information for the public as well as uh, I think you all are aware that this map is on the town's website. Uh, the GIS department has done a great job to identify those structures on the map, those contributing structures. So you can you know, look at those little flags and be able to, to determine if the property you're interested in is listed as a contributing structure. The proactive steps, uh, this is just a summary of the steps to move forward. The first would be an identification of um, what would be defined as neglect. So again, just because it's uh, visible and gone through the process, you know, a roof is caving in, um, needs to be secured and stabilized, what are the steps? Staff would go out with the building official, historic preservationist, and determine what needs to be done to, um, to maintain that structure. Work with the property owner to come up with the preservation plan determine any remediation, whether it's building permits, um, what needs to be done structurally. Uh, there is also an appeal process. If someone disagrees with the town's um, findings, they can, can appeal that. There's a process uh, in the proposed ordinance that outlines uh, the steps on how that's done. Um, again, just kind of briefly what I went through, there's some particulars as far as how often you can continue to request that, those conditions of neglect, um, specifically spelled out. And I will state too that we have worked, town staff has worked with um, Terry Finger's office and Richardson LaBruce on the legalities of the proposed ordinance and used others. City of Beaufort and City of Savannah also have um, what they refer to as demo by neglect. We're trying to be more positive and have proactive preservation and use those as far as examples to move forward. This here is a list, I won't read through them all, but just examples of what we would determine to be defined as neglect. So again, it's just to maintain that there's no further deterioration or the integrity of that, the historic uh, contrib contributing structures is not lost. Again, just to further outline what happens um, after town staff goes out there. So again, that there's clear expectations to the property owners as far as what, what that entails, that preservation plan and those next steps. Again, always have an appeal process. Um, there may be a different perspective. Maybe we got it wrong. I hope we didn't. But if possible, there is a process to go through that and um, determine whether that's been met. There's also that economic hardship that was further described in the ordinance, uh, the proposed ordinance before you. So if there are um, economic hardships and things that, that are making, putting some obstacles in that path, again, hopefully as we move forward and I bring other ordinance amendments before you, that staff could help identify some other tools that could be used uh, to ensure the, again, integrity of the structures. A little bit more information on what the economic hardship entails and how that process uh, would go through. That would go to the Historic Preservation Commission for um, additional review just to add that, that next layer. As with any other um, violations of the Unified Development Ordinance, there are penalties and remedies if someone does not uh, follow through, and ultimately the town could perform the work and place a lien on the property. And this is similar to what we have in the Municipal Code for Building Code for um, uninhabited and unsecured structures. So this is kind of that next level. 
I won't go through all of this, but then uh, we do have review criteria that we review all of our ordinance language against um, to make sure that it is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other plans. That's all in your packet. Planning Commission also reviewed um, staff's findings for this and did find that they met the review criteria. Happy to go back to anything. Again, this evening, this is first reading, so what we are asked, town staff is asking is that you either approve the application and those uh, UDO text amendments as proposed, approve them with conditions, um, or deny them, or you can choose to table. But again, this is what we're uh, bringing forward this evening. Next steps would be second and final reading, uh, public hearing by town council, and then again, our, the proposed effective date would be January 1 to align with the other ordinances. And should we have to make tweaks, we'll obviously come back and make any tweaks necessary. Entertain a motion this evening. There it is. Any questions? Pat? I have a question. Yeah. Um, before I get there, I do have a, a comment uh, towards it. I love the intent of the, the proactive approach. Um, however, I am concerned as the um, property owner ultimately has... Um, you know, final say on their property. Um, I'm concerned that this adds a, another level, it seems, or another layer of um, bureaucracy that kind of convolutes their frustrations with the designation of properties that they uh, structure on their property that they may feel is not contributing and they might have other plans for it. And if they do find themselves in that hardship category, and um, I believe the language in here said that uh, we could give them opportunity, we could discuss opportunities of financial assistance that would be explored, and we don't necessarily have the means to say we can give you X amount of money to um, keep this structure and fix it up the way that you want. Um, my concern is ultimately what, what um, benefit is it really to them if we're just able to kind of make that designation but the, prop, the structure itself might still sit there and remain unrenovated uh, or um, in you know, disarray if, they're, if they financially don't have the means to um, do the recommendations that we might make. Well, I'm saying like, what, sure would, started. <laughs> what, would, what would be, so what would be our next step if we make these recommendations and we give them options of other places where they can explore financial assistance, what ultimately are, are we doing? Like, what's going to be the end goal? Like, does the property still remain in disarray if after those options are given, they still can't do anything with it? I want to make sure, like, we're not just creating something that ultimately there's no end goal to. Like, it just becomes a, 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 a never-ending circle, pretty much. Well, um, if I could, there, there could be two different options. One could be that if... Um, it is still determined by town council that it's a contributing structure and should remain on the contributing structures list, per se, that the town would go ahead and do the remediation efforts um, and place a lien on the property. Or should the applicant, the other option that the applicant can move forward with is to request that it be removed from the contributing structures list because it no longer um, has the has those characteristics to be included on the contributing structures list and have it removed from the list. If it's removed from the list, then this wouldn't pertain. So that would be another um, action that the, that the applicant could go through. So either the town would do the work and place a lien on the property, or the structure could, would be, deter could be determined to be non-contributing anymore, no longer on the list, and then be treated like any other structure in the historic district. Right. And I'm asking that because I know we've, we've had this issue, a conversation coming before, and usually one of the um, options that always comes up is, you know, a person could take the structure and we could relocate it somewhere else. And so, you know, I just don't want to continue to create that conversation. If we don't have a, a long range plan of how we're going to address those issues as they come up. I'll let I'll go to the end, so I'll answer that. In continuation from where Bridget just uh, left off, <clears throat> what's in the box? You said we have a toolbox. What's in the box? Well, right now we don't have a lot as far as economic incentives. We really don't don't have much other than what we can send to the state, or if it's a 
home ownership and neighborhood assistance program, which is separate from historic preservation program altogether. But what we are looking to put in the box is the Bailey Bill, which is essentially a freeze on uh, your local, your property taxes prior to your rehabilitation or um, your remodeling. So it's your, ta your taxes are frozen for a time period that's determined by town council. That's coming before you in the next couple months, uh, the Bailey Bill. Along with the Bailey Bill, at the workshop, we had kind of a whole different variety of other options to explore, and you had asked town count or town staff to what other tools are there. Another tool we've looked at is um, expanding the program, expanding or creating a new program that would that would add like tree removal or tree trimming or clearing, so that structures aren't essentially engulfed in vines or trees, a tree that may present a hazard to a historic structure. For example, the tree may fall on the, the home or the, the structure, which again threatens the integrity of the, of the structure. So that's a program that um, Glenn Umberger is working on and researching right now, so that's going to come before you soon. And then along with that, also just the contributing structures criteria and list itself. So um, as you may recall, a while back, town staff came to you and said, okay, is this the right criteria? Is it 50 years or old or all of these other criteria or is it 50 years and a significant um, architecture or significant place or significant cultural? So that's something that town staff has just completed the review of the list and the data, and so that's coming before you as well. So those are the tools that we envision will be in the box. We're just not there when yet. I thought I'd talk to Chris, because Chris did a lot of research helping that that's not the next right. generation <laughs> of owners, really, and I, which yep. I'll bring up after Dan, and you didn't speak yes, to Yes, I it. did not. I apologize for that. That's another one. That's an expansion of almost the, you know, even that, that tree mitigation that I discussed, a facade improvement, a structural improvement program that would provide some sort of economic um, assistance to contributing structures. So whether it be, it could be new windows, a new roof, um, whatever it may be, would, would expand to include that as well. So I apologize. I did leave that That's out. That's okay. I was excited about that. That would actually be a grant program for the... Not, not in the same toolbox as neighborhood assistance. No, Correct. no not at all. Separate. Okay. Correct. Okay. Sorry. I just want to make sure she... Are there any state, federal grants possibly? There, yes, there are some, um, and I do have, I apologize, I don't have it uh, this evening um, before you, but there are some state and federal uh, grants and um, monies available, but until we move forward with the Bailey Bill and some others, there's, there's not a lot that we have found. Um, but we do always look to SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, for extra assistance. But probably need to come up in the workshop. What meet what meeting those criteria to be eligible for those funds? We haven't quite got that far yet. <laughs> we have yet. to. Those those are. Uh, Think going to be some obstacles have to be ironed out as well. Before we feel comfortable, let's say our toolbox is going to be substantial enough for us to impose some of these, um, I guess, fines or obviously, if the towns decide that they're going to step in with our government. We're going to also have to put a lien on someone's property. And the town doesn't have the, the funding mechanism to even do that kind of structure repairs either. We don't have the funds in our toolbox yet. So let's, in the workshop, let's try to have The other question, in that workshop, I, I know we're going to decide what makes it a contributing structure, what, what, um, what, what, what value that 
property have that says we want this to remain a considered asset? Is there a number, town or state, required for us to have to make this a histor um, historic destination by number of structure we keep? No, sir, there is not. There's not a number. Um, however, when we report, if you lose structures or they're demolished or removed from the list, then that's something that is included on the report. But when we've talked with um, SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, there's no number of when you lose that designation. Um, anytime you make changes, it's you know something that we do have to report to them. We have to report as a certified local government yearly on an annual basis. So it's something that could um, you know, it could change your designation, but they did not, they were not able to give us any kind of concrete answers to the exact number. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you. This has been a long time in the making, uh, something that I've been eager to see, and I know it's complicated. And to go back to what everybody at the, <clears throat> the counter here has said today is I, um, I understand, you know, we all know that um, historic preservation can be very costly, uh, but you don't want to give up all your history and your culture of your your town or your community. In some places recently, I don't know if it was Charleston or wherever it was, somebody just got a threatening letter from uh, the historic society or something saying they would lose their designation when you start doing away with too many structures. But what I wanted to ask was... Um, this is probably a more of a legal question. Because we're a certified, um, what is it called, Cert CLG? Certified local government. government certified legal go local, excuse me, legal government, which created the HPC. Um, they have last say on, on all historic issues. Town council does not. Correct. All right, so... We're having a discussion. Actually, about if I could just correct myself, other than removal or addition to the contributing structures list, that is ultimately up to town council. Okay, but on the on the top, and thank you on the topic of um, economic hardship. So, and and I saw you did a lot of work trying to put a mechanism in here to give us something to work with when we run across a situation where somebody has a contributing structure that there's just maybe no way that they can afford to do anything with it. So I saw that. But um, so during the appeal of an economic economic hardship, that goes before the Historic Preservation Committee. This is what I want to know because there is the historic applications and what creates a historic situation and, and why they get the rule and, and council doesn't. But when it crosses over the threshold to it's an economic hardship, can they not be a recommending body to council at that point and let that authority come back to council only on the economic hardship, let alone the contributing structure aspect? I can certainly find out for you. I'm not, that may be an option, but I'm not That's, sure. I believe that would be a possibility if that was the will of council. You see the reason I want to bring this up is I don't want a committee ruling on something that we may not want them to rule on. It goes back to Bridget and Fred's comments. We would have final jurisdiction over that if we can do it. We need to take the heat. We don't need to pass that off to the HPC. Um, the, other, the other comment I was going to make is, is because this is so costly that everybody here is is uh, knowledgeable about with the, the Garvin Garvey House, what we're going to do with Squire Pope, and et cetera. Um, the Bailey Bill is a great tool. We and you, I think I heard you say that we would figure out the timeline. Some places do 10 years, some do less. We would determine that period of time. Yes, Council. Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And again, but that's not going to salvage historic structure. That's a small drop in the bucket to the overall need. So... I, and I know that we mentioned there's potential grants out there and things that we haven't explored yet, which is, is good. And to the front and councilman Hamilton's point, we'll learn that at a workshop. But, uh, you know, if we're as passionate about our history as we are, and we're trying to save these buildings as we have been, 
um, you know, I would think that we should consider also some kind of funding on behalf of the town council for the government at Bluffton to do something just like we do with the Affordable Housing Committee. Those two things are paramount into our DNA and how we identify and how we see ourselves. So I, I would like to like us to explore that. Now that would purely come from council, you know, the funding mechanism and how much we'd want to do in addition to grants. So that, that's really all I had on that one. Question before I went on, because my brain. Now you don't remember? Buffering. <laughs> um, so this, um, I think you get the feeling we all just want to help our residents. And I'm actually, Bridget relayed a young lady. She's in her 30s. She's now the recipient of a house that she really needed to sit and talk about why is it why, what, when, where, all of it. Um, and it's really been a kind of a fun, fun project. And I love being part of it because now she's buying into this understanding. We, we are putting tools out there to hopefully pass. Um, one other thing was the uh, hopeful use of our Bluffton Historic Foundation, which so closely resembles Savannah Historic Foundation that raises money to help these structures. So I'm hoping that presentation will take roots and the Bluffton Historic Foundation can start a arm to start raising money. So there's another tool outside of the town's toolbox. But you, this needs to go in place to even get to the next step question, to get to the next step of providing help. No, not necessarily. Um, no, not necessarily at all. This is just, we had several, like I mentioned, the, the several different um, policies and whether it be uh, additions to the municipal code or whether it be um, amendments to the unified development ordinance. So this is just one of those amendments. We certainly don't need to um, adopt this first by any means. Some of it we do, like I will be bringing forward contributing structures, changes to that and the unified development ordinance before the Bailey bill, for example. So that that is steps. This is not necessarily that case at all. Um, so you can choose to, we can take your comments and wait and do first reading at a later date. You could do first reading tonight and then we address the rest at second reading. And if there's substantial changes, um, change it. It's really at the will of council. Um, and I know this has been on our list of things to do. And if we put things off, all of a sudden we're going to be sitting here until 1230 one night because we keep putting things off. So I like that you put it before us. I'm interested in all of of the workshop of all the other tools. And I'm guessing, I heard Fred say we're having a workshop, so I guess we are. <laughs> Sounds um, like it. <laughs> because I am so. curious. <laughs> I didn't know we were, but I'm all about it. Uh, Fred said it, so. um, Because we want to get the tools right. I think we need to all be supportive of the tools. And I also think the actual contributing structure list should almost have a subcategory of what do we feel are the important ones that maybe would qualify for grants, funding, arm hand-holding, you know, really taking it on. And I think we probably could all find 20 of those that are really important stories and um, history that we don't turn into, you know, cleaned up Bluffton. I, you know, so I guess those are my questions. Thank we you can, for bringing it forward. Um, and, sorry, and we can certainly do that. Um, we just already had the contributing structures list. So that's what we applied it to, but we can look into additional... Or maybe we can all talk about it sure. when you bring it to us. But um, did you take the note? I do think if it can be done on the hardship, I think we all are so boots on the ground, not that we are the end all, but we do know more stories and maybe we have a little more compassion on the hardship case. So I would like you to make sure that's in this. And I don't know if you're taking notes and it'll be shown if it goes to second reading. Yes. Yes, I do have that. Back to the workshop that I originally, I, I guess I, <laughs> I, I, I may come to fruition here. Um, I was told in somewhere that we are going to have a workshop about contributing structures. Where does that come from? Because I was Challenge? told that. <laughs> I didn't tell you. Told me that. We are working on it. I know that for certain, <laughs> so we it, certainly can. It was, we, we, it was always said that we, our uh, definition for contributing structures is, is it's not, doesn't have any meat to the bone. Mm -hmm. 
So we need to refine that or, re or rework it so, so that we can properly and fairly give some instructions or direction for people who think they have a contributing structure. So I think um, the only thing that, that I could recall someone said that it's a building that's 50 years old. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't give it a, an uh, identification destination for me. So I'm fine. Kevin, shake, Kevin, did you tell him that we're having a workshop? Because you're shaking your head. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you got to watch for Ed, Mayor. Happy to have a workshop. We can certainly do that. I think it's important. Um, okay. Okay. Anything else? I think the important thing is, is that Councilman Hamilton indicated we did not want to be seen as big brother putting our thumbs on people and making them do things. I think the whole intent of this, uh, these changes or to try to make it a collaborative process. How can we help get where this building needs to get to? And I think that's the intent. I think that's the intent of council. Um, and I think that kind of comes through clear in, in Heather's presentation and the way we've tried to structure this whole deal. How do, we, how do we find as much economic assistance for those who need it to make sure that that building remains um, habitable, proper, and things of that sort. I hear Councilman Wood talking about he'd like to have the economic hardship issue here as opposed to HBC. Um, and I also hear um, Councilman Wood saying, um, I guess to Chris, perhaps, we need to look at the budget for next year or maybe or, or an amendment or some changes so there might even be a budget line um, for this economic hardship relief. Oh. Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. We have ARPA possible ARP money. We have possible ATAX money, right. and it's been building up and building up and building up. I think it's a perfect time to find these, all these projects that we're so passionate about really get laser focused. Can I say something real quick because I'm going to forget it again? Um, Bridget had mentioned a meeting or so ago when we were talking about this to have some kind of hard copy, something on the internet, something to send to these young people who are inheriting these homes on all of this. Once we get through, please don't forget that. We need to give something to people. Um, I think with the young lady, Chris, you and I were dealing with, thank goodness for Chris helping because I really didn't have anything to go by. So I, I see the need. And even for, <clears throat> um, especially for the um, younger folks, as you said, who are going to inherit, and even for the older um, folks, you know, I think going back to what Terry said, we all agree that the presentation here is, is very, um, very thorough. Um, the concern, though, when you see the language of saying, you know, the assistance could come and potentially a lien, um, you know, for some folks, there's just a, a not so um, savory history when it comes to putting a lien on your property in terms of repair. Uh, some folks, especially you know, some native, Gullah natives here, have lost their properties and homes um, in promise of someone who was going to do good work to a structure and end up losing um, you know, generational uh, wealth there. And so I don't want to, um, I want to make sure that we have the language clear. So if someone were to ask a question, there are things that we can uh, answer to them and um, you know, so if we're going through a workshop or whatever it is, just want to make sure that we have that language firm and explicit so people don't, um, you know, look or, or think that we're trying to get over or swindle them out of their um, their property. Mayor, I have one more comment. I, I want to say, and this is kind of touching on something you just mentioned, um, the contributing structure list coming back to us, and, and I do remember some time back, more than a year or two ago, there was contributing structure list was going to come back at some point, and we're glad that's happening. I think where we are, um, at the end of the day, as the town continues to age, you have more and more contributing structures, or what could qualify as a contributing structure. And I think when the list comes back to this body, I think we're going to have to do some hard soul searching and make some tough decisions and identify out of our contributing structure list maybe some that are high priority to us, for example, the Red Dot or the Allen Lockwood House or others like that. We don't want to see those go away. 
So we may have to give certain ones a real high priority because then this is where we will put our resources to work with somebody that you know either can or cannot afford to do something. But we don't want to lose those. So again, we'll have to make some tough decisions. That was kind. Of, that was a much better way of asking what I asked. Um, any other questions, comments? There's a motion. Is there a motion to approve amendments to the Town of Bluffton Code of Ordinances, Chapter 23, UDO Article 3, application to establish Section 326? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. I mean, I'll pass. I fail. Well, doesn't pass, it doesn't fail. It's tied. Have enough to do it. it fails. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Um, Next is a second and final reading, consideration of an ordinance repealing and replacing the Town of Bluffton Code of Ordinances, Chapter 6, Article 2, uh, chapter, chapter 6, Article 3. Second and final reading. Natalie, were there changes from first reading? Good evening. No, there were no changes. Did anyone want to discuss anything y'all voted on last council meeting? Any other questions of Natalie on this one item? It goes to the motion. Um, this is second and final reading. It was passed unanimously last council. I'm trying to talk to get to the motion. Meeting. What's there? Sorry, I went That's too okay. far. That's okay. I have there it. There we up. go. Um, is there a motion to approve on ordinance repealing or replacing the Town of Bluffton Code of Ordinances, Chapter Six, Business and Business Regulations, Article Two, Business License and Regulations, to comply with Act 176 of 2020 and amending Chapter Six, Business and Business Regulations, Article Three, Soliciting and Mobile Vending, to add definition section. So moved. Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor, step by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Um, Chris, good evening. Uh, we are item three under formal agenda items. This is second and final reading, consideration of an ordinance relating to the renewal franchise agreements between the Town of Bluffton and its electric service providers, Palmetto Electric and Dominion. In the past, these were two items on the agenda, and we've combined them. Am I right? Uh, we or was the other just a resolution? No, it was just a resolution. Okay. So this is second so this reading. Is of the, second the, um... This was uh, unanimous with council. There were no... Um, changes. We do have uh, Ashley with, with Palmetto Electric here. If y'all had any additional questions, do y'all have questions of either? Blake Lou with Dominion Energy is here. Oh gosh, you were behind Chris. I didn't see you. So we have Blakely with Dominion and we have Ashley with Palmetto Electric. Do y'all have questions since they are here? Thank y'all for coming. And we are getting to. Don't see the motion. Make in me. Here. Well, let's go. Is there a motion to uh, vote on second and final reading the ordinance relating to the renewal franchise agreements between the town of Bluffton and its electric service providers, Palmetto Electric and Dominion Energy? Move. Your second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Four. Four zero. Um, thank you, Chris. We have consent agenda items, which are all really important. Please go on and click the link on our thank you, ladies, for the items because our reports are very important. Um, is there anything y'all would like pulled off? Yeah, the um, Don Ryan Center for Innovation. Okay, anything else? So, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda with the uh, Something you do you want to make a statement question? Do you want to ask Stephen publicly so we can get you information? Well, yeah, I had a, a you must vote question. On this, but are you okay, okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. With the exception of Don Ryan Center, is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Ms. Frazier, you have a question on Don Ryan Center. Um, yeah, if they could, I'd like to have it on the, um, the agenda for our next meeting, but my question is a report just on the businesses, the status of businesses um, being incubated in Bluffton, those who, um, the type of assistance they're receiving, and a, um, like a demographic report on the businesses that the um, center is assisting or incubating. Please, could you make sure Mr. Levine either gets that in the Don Ryan report? Um, I just want to clarify. Um, and making a presentation will be good, if we could. I mean, others no, might, no, 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 no. might want to know. know I didn't mean to look at you like that. I, you did. You gave me an evil stink. No, I didn't give you the stink. I was thinking, oh, y'all worry me with long agendas. So. Well, well into the kind of feedback on that conversation and having that dialogue with the presentation, the council probably wants to hear from other people as well. Right. As a I'm difference with you. between I requested two. it myself, the town manager. Sir, <laughs> there's a difference between what you're asking and what Bridget is asking. I, I'll make sure that it All includes right. both of those. <laughs> okay. All right. But but um, we get those presentations. Time is of the essence. Understood. Okay. So are you all on the same page of what you would like? And, Dan, you had requested it. Do you all want Mr. Levine to to come and make a presentation? Is that what y'all would like? Okay. We'll get that on September's, September's agenda. Okay. So with that, with that caveat or that request, is it, is it now proper to have a motion to approve the report that you have in your packet from them? Because without, without it, that uh, report we, from, from in the packet today will just lay on the table on the corner somewhere and would not be approved. I gotcha. Um, yes, if if um, both Ms. Frazier and Mr. Wood are comfortable that we'll have a um, presentation next month. And I would ask if you could go in and send it to us. Or would you like a more public presentation? I like what she asked for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. I, I think it's overdue, and, okay. uh, and, I, and and not just stats. I mean, give us a little bit of history about, you know, pre-COVID, COVID, and then where they're going from here. Um, okay, so we do need to, it is a consent agenda item, so we're going to go back to do a second vote to include, or do we just do a, a are just you? A, a, you've already approved everything else, just that you would approve um, the Don Ryan report that's in the consent agenda. So is there a motion to approve the Don Ryan Center for Innovation um, Department report under the consent agenda? Is renovation? Don Ryan Center for Innovation. Innovation. Oh. I, I'll make that You're motion. You're on a renovation line. <laughs> you can't hear me through here. I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? <laughs> All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Poor Dan, he can't. If you couldn't hear, I know you can't hear. No, I got him in tonight. So. <laughs> That's funny. Maybe renovation. Um, and it also kind of goes back to our committee seats. Larry is on that as our liaison. Um, so if that's something, I will tell you, but we don't want to go back to the days we had every department make presentations not too long ago. And they were a good 20 to 30 minutes each. That's why we created this consent agenda. Um, so after this, let's make sure if we have council members on those committees, they can also tell all of us, you know, whatever the high points are. Okay. Um, thank you. And we'll get that on September. Um, there is an executive session. So is there a motion to go? Oh, yes. Either Mr. Cesar, I have a, a question for he you. Can't, I know I'm not. I'm, I'm yeah. trying to get used to had a query for you on the, the vote 2-2. Two, two. We just wanted to receive guidance as we continue to move forward. Is it now in the past of one vote to support the continued activities to bring back or to let die as the vote was 2-2? Two, two? I, I think we need to have the workshop. 
So continue to research and prepare it as right. part of future discussions. So would you be more comfortable with all this being on one with all the historic resources and needs that we need to do to be together in one meeting? Or if it has to be, I mean, if the Bailey bill has to be after something, there may be some lingering um, items. I'd like to see that more together so now you know what the resources could be. Well, I remember the report on the Bailey bill. My Everything in the presentation to me is, is perfectly fine. I just want to make sure like we have um, a clear understanding and it's explicit on what's required of the um, property owner with the stipulations for the purposes of like the lien for for example I want to make sure that that's clearly outlined before we move forward would you all of us because maybe we all have different thoughts would we all commit to sending our thoughts are getting with Steven so he can clearly get this to Heather like within before next council meeting we're not going to see it next council meeting because I think it's more October, November, but can we give ourselves a month to really sit with Stephen? Oh my, I think I need to sit with Stephen and Heather. Okay, and just, you know, on the lean, we've done that through neighborhood assistance and it's really helped owners. I think the word lean might be a little frightening but I think we is not I think it's the difference is the the those come into the neighborhood's assistance the um, the amount of the size of the project is completely different opposed to what what would take for the restoration of a contributing structure so we don't you, do a lean on well we on. used to no, we, don't. we did a lean on the man who we removed all the boats and put a lean on his property do we not do that anymore? Uh, I think she's saying that she can answer that, but it's okay. for uninhabited. It's, it, correct. It's not through the neighborhood assistance program. It's for unsafe, uninhabited structures or properties, part of the municipal code, not the neighborhood assistance program. So Okay, but we have in the past improved correct. property, yes, and the reason, and I don't like that word because I think it does scare some people, but if they were to use our money to clean up a property and then go to resell it and we want to just recoup our investment in them, giving them the, and we don't want them to sell it, but if they were to sell it off of public money, the public needs to be reimbursed. That's Absolutely. So we got to figure out a way what lean means and be, we all got to be on this to make this work. I think we have an understanding. We just wanted to make sure whether this needed to be continued to be discussed and pursued or else let, absolutely. let lie. Yeah, so absolutely. thank you. Would you, I know that he wants to meet with y'all, and I think all of us will hopefully come to you and not have you remind us. So. Reach out, and we'll schedule. Okay. Was that it? I'm looking around the room. Is there a motion to go into executive session for personnel matters regarding town council appointments of boards, committees, and commissions? That's Act 34. 70A1 and legal advice regarding concealed carry permit law at special events within the town. That's Act 3470A1. Second. Second. Any discussion? Um, I think if anyone's listening, the newspaper article made it very sound very easy, but I think we will learn tonight and in future months it, it's going to put a lot of the onerous on the town for this weapons permit. Um, carry, conceal carry permit. All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We're in executive session. Um, I'll let you decide who can leave and go. I'm never gonna let you go. I'm never gonna let you go. Babe, I'm never gonna let you go. No, no, never gonna let you go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Never gonna let you go. Session. No action was taken. No votes were cast. But there is. Um, what is there? There is a motion out of executive session. Um, is there a motion to appoint Bill Fuge and Jim Biggs to the Don Ryan Center for Innovation? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Aye. Aye. I suppose. Thank you.
there a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> I knew it was on your mind. <laughs>
whether you're married, single, separated, so forth and so on. We do require the last four digits of your social security number, cell phone number, and please make sure when you're putting in your email address that you double check the email because this is one of the ways we will make contact back to you. You will get a confirmation that the application was received. Continue on, we'll need the mailing address, we'll need your spouse's information. If you're legally married, we will need that information because as long as you're legally married in South Carolina, you're considered to be one entity, regardless if your spouse name is on the property or not. You will then answer the questions here. As you see, the questions are simply yes or no. Select all of the answer that's appropriate to you. Once you get to the end of the application, you will then need to upload your document. So you need to make sure your documents are somewhere that you can go in and you can upload that document. Select the disclaimer that you understand what you're doing, what you're submitting. And then once you submit this application, you will then receive a confirmation from our office letting you know that the application was received. That's the end of the online application. However, you can also apply by using the hard copy. Go back to the assessor's office homepage. You scroll over to our forms. Once there, it is the first form that says PDF, Legal Residence Exemption Application. You will simply just print this application out, fill it out, copy your documents. So at this time, you can submit your form. All documents may be submitted by mail, fax, or hand delivered. Our mailing address is P.O. Box 1228, Buford, South Carolina, 29901. Fax number 843-255-9404. And again, thank you for allowing me this time with you. We can be reached at 843-255-9404. 2400 is our main office number. You can email our office at assessor at bcgov.net or through the Citizen Gram. And until next time, be safe. Thank you. When the storm comes, the twister forms, and the wind starts ripping things away, you'll ask yourself, how prepared or unprepared are you? Do you have a shelter, a safe place to go, something to shield you that's easy to get to? Is it stocked with all the things you need? Water, food, and batteries. What about your family, your kids? Do they know what to do, where to go, and how to stay in touch? If a watch is declared, a tornado might be on its way, getting ready to blow things away. Stay informed, wait for updates. And if you're outside or out for a ride, move close to somewhere you'll stay safe. When a watch becomes a warning, you have to act fast. Get to safety. Do not delay. Go as low as you can and hold on tight until everything is all right. Once the storm has passed and you get the all clear, take your supplies. Now, you must be wise. Move carefully. Watch out for dangerous debris. Protecting yourself is a necessity. So before the storm comes, the twister forms, and the wind starts ripping things away, get prepared. Make a plan and practice what to do to stay safe. America's Preparathon. Be smart. Take part. Prepare. Get started today. Go to ready.gov slash prepare.